Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Carrie and today I am doing my August wrap up. I only read five books in August but given how often I was not here on a weekend thinking about it, I'm not mad about that. I went up to Duluth twice in the month of August and then my parents came up for the last uh, weekend of August and we went to the Minnesota Renaissance Festival which was really really fun and that's definitely my one of my favorite things to do. Moving on, these are the five books that I read in August. We are going to start with The Evil Queen by Gina Showalter. This book was fantastic. I gave it I think a four and a half or five out of five stars because loved it. Oh my goodness. This book takes the origin story of The Evil Queen from Snow White and just runs amok with it, basically. It's amazing. Our world as we know it with technology and where fairy tales are just cautionary tales of, I don't know, trusting your stepmother, even though that's a whole other thing, they're fine. Moving on, cautionary tales or just hopeful tales, whatever you want to classify them as, our world is where fairy tales aren't real. But as it turns out in this book, our world and the fairy tale world are sort of parallel universes and you can get from one to the other. Our main character finds out that she is prophesied to be the evil queen from Snow White. Uh-huh, it gets better. So from there she decides there is no way come hell or high water she is going to be the evil queen from Snow White, no matter who prophesied it. She will be her own person, thank you very much, and have a nice day. So we watch her as she journeys into the fairy tale world and basically fights tooth and nail not to become the evil queen that we all know and dislike. It didn't break the fourth wall, so to speak. It's, there's no second person in it, and obviously it's not a, th a play of any sort, so you can't really break a fourth wall, but it felt a little bit that way because there are a lot of references to other Snow White retellings. So she studies all of these retellings to help figure out how to avoid being the evil queen. There is definitely romance in this. It's a bit insta-lovey, but it's more enemies to lovers kind of a thing, which I really love. That's just one of my favorite tropes. The descriptions are pretty good. The character building is actually fantastic. My favorite part, maybe not my favorite, but one of my favorites is hands down the cover. This is why I bought the book in the first place. I saw the cover, read that she be, it's the Evil Queen villain story or origin story and I just I had to buy it because beautiful but it just the back of it says in the forest of good and evil every hero is a villain and every villain is a hero it just depends on who you ask. I oh my favorite part was definitely how she just took the origin story and took the idea of being a villain and completely turned it on, turned it on its head. It was amazingly well done. The characters are great. There's no real good or bad in this because like it says on the back, it just depends on who you ask. If you are looking for a good, pretty angsty retelling, this is definitely the one to read. This is amazing. So in hindsight, I definitely gave it a five out of five. Next, I read The Princess Bride by William Goldman. To be clear, this is an abridged version of the one by William Morgenstern. This is the one that the movie was based on, so it has a lot of italicized bits, and of course I can't find one. There you are. I don't know if you can see that, but that whole page basically is italicized. Because those are Mr. Goldman's comments about what was in the parts he took out and why he took it out, or what was going on in his personal life, or etc, etc. The italicized bits I appreciated when they were more about, well, Morgenstern put in 80 pages of royalty school and what Buttercup learned on how to be a royal, and then said, you don't need to read 80 pages of that, it's dumb, the only important thing is Humperdinck did something, and then move on. The personal bits were interesting, but not my favorite part. I did give this a 4 out of 5 stars because I think it is cheeky and hilarious, and it has everything you need. It's got adventure, it's got love, it's got villains twists and it's great. This was the book I was planning on reading for the Reading Rush book to movie adaptation. That didn't happen because again, failing at my DVRs, but I did finally read it and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Like I said, it's very cheeky and sarcastic and it just, 
There we go. He kept, uh, Goldman kept saying that Morgan Cern meant this as a satire. And that comes across in a lot of this book. There are some parts where it's just straight up fantasy, you know, rodents of unusual size being part of it. But then most of it where he makes comments like, oh, well, it's older than Paris. But then again, everything is older than Paris. Those were just really these satirical elements that I thought were hilarious. So I did enjoy this book. Like I said, there were some overly, not explicit, but bits that I didn't think needed to be in there as far as the personalization from Mr. Goldman. But still loved it, still really enjoyed it, and I did understand the personal parts because it helped explain why he had taken certain bits out of the original that he had. Then I read Iron Gold by Pierce Brown, which is a large book, and it is number four in the Red Rising series. I meant to read this in July. Pierre Ford was hosting a read long where you read Red Rising, Golden Sun, Morning Star, and Iron Gold from June 1st to July 30th, because July 30th was when Dark Age, the fifth book, came out. Did I get to Dark Age? No, no, I did not. Will I get to it in September? Hopefully. Let's find out. But I finished Iron Gold in August. This follows Darrow, Virginia, and the rest of the characters from Red Rising 10 years in the future. I had forgotten quite how big a part Lysander plays in this, so that was fun on reread. I'm really curious to see where we're going after this because <laughs> yeah, this could be fun. But like I said, it follows all of them 10 years after the first trilogy ends. It was well written again. I did love the fact that we got to see more from different classes. So it wasn't like the first trilogy is almost entirely gold. In this one we get to see from several different casts, basically, and see how the events of the first trilogy affected them, and then how that sort of just affected everything else, without spoiling it. But I did read this, I gave it a 4 out of 5. Then I read probably my least favorite book of the month, which is Ogre Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. And by least favorite I mean I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars, because it was still a good book. It's a bit Beauty and the Beast-esque. We follow our main character, whose name is Evie, and she is a healer. She loves to heal people, she loves to help people, and then Lucinda shows up. If you've seen Ella Enchanted, you know who Lucinda is, but for those of you who have no idea who Lucinda is, she is a fairy and she gives gifts, meaning that in Ella Enchanted, or the movie anyway, she gives Ella the gift of obedience, so Ella has to do whatever she's told. In this, she gives Evie, that's the character's name, the gift, I guess, of being turned into an ogre. And if she can find somebody to love her as an ogre in like 61 days or something, then she'll turn human again. If not, she stays an ogre forever. That would be the Beauty and the beast desk part. So as an ogre, she can't tell anybody. She's enchanted from, she's enchanted that in a way that stops her from saying, I'm Evie, I was just turned into an ogre by Lucinda. So nobody knows it's her except the friend that she was with when she was turned into the ogre. And we go from there. It was fine. Um, I think it was overly predictable and I didn't really like Evie much at all. Which is unfortunate, but I'm still glad I read it and now I'm curious to read Ella Enchanted because I read another one of Gail Carson Levine's books, The Two Princesses of Bamar, when I was younger and I recently reread it. And I still love that book. So I know Levine is a good writer and I know that I enjoy some of her works. This unfortunately just not was was not one of them. And the last book, which I guess technically was the first book I read, because if you've noticed I don't do these in any sort of chronological order, it's just whatever order they come off the shelf, was Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt Scamander, aka JK Rowling. Because that's how this works. Uh, this was also meant to be part of my Reading Rush TBR, but that didn't work out, so here we are. This is about 120 pages, and it is an A to Z dictionary, I guess, of all, or most of, let's go with most of, the animals from Harry Potter. So there's a whole section on dragons, and it has a whole bunch of different types of dragons, and the history that we know of, about them, and what they can do, how dangerous they are, like the... Hebridean Black, there we go. 
which is Britain's other native dragon, more aggressive than its Welsh counterpart, 100 square miles per dragon, 30 feet in length, rough scale, purple eyes, razor sharp bridges along its back, arrow shaped spike, bat like wings, etc. So they go through that from A to Z. If I could find the A, I would tell you what the A was. There we go. It starts with Acromantula, which is the giant spider, and that is only R, continues all the way to W, because there's no Z, apparently. Y, it goes to Y, Yeti. Also known as Bigfoot, the abominable snowman, all that. I think I gave this one a three or a four out of five, maybe a 3.5. I liked it, but I think a lot more could have gone into it, and I think a lot more should have gone into it. I did really enjoy the comments done by, it's either Harry or Ron, possibly both. For example, the Acromantula has like 10 X's next to it, and the X's denote how dangerous it is. They've had several run-ins with the Acromantulas, they're not big fans of them. I did enjoy that bit, I enjoyed the background of it, I just, it left me wanting a lot more, and given the fact that Harry Potter is so popular, I think it would have been a good idea for Miss Rowling to have done more in the Hogwarts library in general. But that's just my opinion, and I am just one person, and clearly not important. So, that is my take on this book. Liked it and wanted more. I didn't stumble over, over my words as much in this one, that's exciting. Anyway, that is my August book haul. I hope I didn't say September anywhere in that, where it shouldn't have been anyway. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you in my next video. Bye.